Hi, everyone. This is Jason Burek of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest. He's published a number of books in the last decade or so. His first book was The Money GPS, Guiding You Through an Uncertain Economy, came out in paperback and Kindle in 2012. His second book is The Money GPS, Global Economic Collapse, which came out in 2017. He also has one of the largest finance and economics YouTube channels, also called The Money GPS. David Quinteri, thank you for joining me again. Thank you very much for having me on. And I got your last name correct, so. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Well, I asked for the pronunciation beforehand. I mean, my my last name is only six letters and people butcher it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So I want to ask first question. I've been asking my guests this and the opinions have been very interesting. So I'll ask you the same question. What do you think are the biggest risks to the global economy right now? So unquestionably, right now, the whole tightening is on the top of the list because the just like an alcoholic or a drug addict, you cannot be weaned off without pain. And we see that with all of these easy money policies that have been going on for so many years to a different degree, you know, Canada has done it one way, US has done it another way, but largely there's been very loose monetary policy, fiscal policy over the last several years. We accelerated that process during 2020 and despite the obvious signs that they should stop this, that they should reduce the amount of money that they were printing or reduce the expansion of the currency supply and everything that they were doing. They said, we're going to keep it going for a little while. And even the biggest names in finance were saying, you know, you should probably back off of that. I mean, that's when you know things get out of whack, when you've got people who are obviously going to benefit from all this, that they're saying, this is crazy. Stop it. Why? Why do they do that? Because it doesn't end well when you do these things. And yet, here we are repeating the cycles over and over again. Gluttony is always punished in the end. So that would be the number one. You know, that's between the interest rate hikes and the quantitative tightening. On the you know the other levels, I mean, you could look at a lot of different places, and I do believe the weakest link right now is Europe, because of how extreme the circumstances are with energy that really could create a big problem germany's nationalizing companies you look at potential for others to do the same thing but literally a shortage and they're saying do not turn the lights on do not take a shower do not do basic things for yourself because we messed up because we are the government and we did not take care of the situation now you can't even take a shower I mean, it's just unbelievable. So those are kind of things, obviously, central bank activities, number one, first and foremost, and number two, being Europe with the energy crisis. And winter is coming in Europe too, and they have a lot of parts of the European Union and Europe, very, very cold winters, and they're already rationing. They're telling people they have to take cold showers. They're telling people you can't use heat or electricity. I think even the demand and cost for to buy wood for firewood, those costs have even gone basically parabolic. It's really unfortunate because regular people, they're just working their nine to five jobs. They're just trying to make ends meet. And then suddenly their government's saying, you can't do this or that. I mean, it's really unfair. I understand what they're trying to do. They're trying to prepare for that winter. They're trying to say, look, if we keep the energy usage up at this point, we're going to be in trouble by the time we get to January. So I get what they're trying to do. My only thoughts here are that you know, the average person is just going to be screwed over. Now, some people, they've gone ahead and, you know, depending on where they live, maybe they have solar panels, maybe they have firewood, maybe they have all these things like in preparation from a while ago. And even my subscribers, I was telling them from 2020, if you can, with your energy provider, get a fixed pricing model, fixed pricing. And I've gotten the emails and the comments from people saying, Thank you so much, in part because of you that, you know, I went to a fixed pricing and now the price is so many, you know, so many multiples higher and I was able to secure this deal for two years or what have you. So maybe they're going to be able to weather the storm as a result of that. You know, it's hard to say in hindsight now, well, you know, I should have done that, but people should just be aware of what's going to happen. Do you think prices of stuff is going to rise 
in the next three months, in the next six months? If so, there are certain actions that you could take. Well, you have governments and, uh, well, especially governments, bad energy policy in the European Union for the last 10, 15, 20 years. They malinvested with green energy and ESG. They didn't allow liquefied natural gas import terminals. They didn't allow a lot of oil and natural gas drilling inside their own landmass. So, I mean, that exacerbated the problem. They don't have liquefied natural gas import terminals in Germany. There's, uh, they have liquefied natural gas import terminals in other parts of the European Union, but then they have to transport the natural gas uh, to other parts of Europe and then in, into Germany. So it's still a logistics problem there, and that's not going to get fixed anytime soon. But that, my point, though, this is all bad government and central bank policy. And then, like you said earlier in the interview, they created all this extra currency and there wasn't as much goods, wasn't as much supply in the economy. And that's why we got just horrible stagflation in many parts of the of the world. And now I'm reading, I just picked up an article that's basically saying the collapse of the uh, basically freight coming out is, is just shocking. Now, I haven't read the full article, so I'm not fully aware, but basically, typically around this time, this is Q4, okay? So when we go into this time of Q, in, going into Q4, what do we have here? We have always, always the amount of freight moving in, especially moving into the US, is always super high. Yet, that has basically just fallen off. So we went to a scenario where the ships couldn't get their cargo on land. It, it was impossible. They, like I know you know about it, and I'm sure your viewers know about it. They were trying so hard to the point where they had <laughs> containers sitting on streets, just randomly put places because they literally they couldn't find place for it. And now today, all of that is completely 180. So what's going on? Is this an actual, you know, uh, reversal of demand? As suddenly they're saying. We don't need it. We don't want it. We bought too much, whatever the case may be. This is really changing right now here in 2022. Well, I think a lot of consumers, especially here in the United States and Western countries, they're out of discretionary income because the rent's up, their mortgage payments are up, their electricity bills, food, energy, transportation costs, diesel, all, uh, all these main necessities that people need for a halfway decent life. All these costs are up a lot with stagflation. It's eating away their savings. It's destroying that. Their discretionary income budgets are being destroyed. And then on top of that, if the economy gets worse, you're looking at a lot of companies uh, already starting to fire and downsize. So it's kind of the worst of both worlds with stagflation. It's so unusual that what I saw statistically with the initial jobless claims that, again, they started to decline. And you wonder where you see countless companies that have said, we are going to you know, uh, re, you know they, they don't say layoff. They don't say fire, of course. They say, you know, increase productivity. And then you look at the fine print and, you know, they're letting people go. So the way, you know, statistically, we're not going to be able to see that probably, but I just really, truly wonder what's happening right now within all these companies. You know, like, definitely we're not in the same situation we were 2008 with the layoffs and big banks just getting rid of people left, right, and center. But we've started to see that. We started to see financial companies do it, tech companies, and others as well. I mean, nothing looks really safe right now. That's the extreme thing. And even with commodities, the prices of you know lumber and all these other ones, um, they've come down a lot from their highs, which is just, it's, extreme to say the least because the last time that we had quantitative tightening which was very minimal the 2018 scenario it was so terrible for assets it was the worst year that i'm aware of the worst year on record in terms of the total amount of assets declining and that was 93 percent of all assets were in the red in 2018 and that was a marginal amount of you know trying to Decrease, trying to you know increase the interest rates along with the um, money printing reduction, uh, quantitative tightening, I should say. It was minimal, and yet it had such a powerful result. And what do you think is going on now? We're already beyond the levels we were at before. Quantitative tightening is only just getting started, but in terms of interest rates. So I really don't know the 
a good result from this, quite frankly. Yeah, I was actually going to ask you what's safe because stocks, bonds, real estate, many commodities are in substantial downtrends already. I mean, the, the oil price because of the global food and energy crisis, oil, natural gas prices, they're holding up okay for now. And physical gold, actually, the paper, well, the gold price, physical gold is expensive with all the premiums. Same thing for physical silver. The premiums are sky high. But the gold price actually had a nice rally once the Fed announced the rate hikes with the 75 basis points. So what asset classes, uh, you, you mentioned, you don't think there's a safe asset class. And if you hold cash in this environment, a lot of people would say maybe short-term treasuries or cash. But if the real the governments and central banks are saying their inflation rates are still 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 percent, and that's the government inflation rate, the real inflation rate's higher, holding cash for one, two, three years doesn't make a lot of sense either, does it? It's it's hard to argue this, you know, holding cash. It really is. However, the wealthiest person I personally know says he's holding on to a big chunk of cash. And all of the people that he knows that are wealthier than him have said we're holding on to an what the word he used was uncomfortable amount of cash. So um that's what they're doing. Now they know more than me, perhaps on the inside. Um, but you, you definitely do want to have some cash. There's no question because some have said S and P at you know thirty three thousand to thirty four hundred suddenly it becomes a buy. Now I don't know how you put numbers on that and, and all that, but um, we're not that far off. And, and even three thousand on the S and P is historically not that cheap. What we need to see is PE ratios coming down to reasonable levels. They're not going to go to historic levels unless we have something devastating. So you ask what assets. Now, it depends on your level of wealth, of course, um, but we need to have diversification. Now, you can hold on to precious metals, but you can't expect the most manipulated assets on earth, gold and silver, to behave the way that other assets may do as, you know, may on their own. But you look at gold and silver, we know. You and I both know, your viewers know. They've been manipulating them. Every two weeks, I see an article, uh, JP Morgan caught uh, manipulating futures price of gold. Like, it's just this constantly. Like, this guy's going to trial. This guy's going to jail. It just constantly happens. And what did they say every time? It was so easy. Everybody was doing it. So, but, but we don't, in my opinion, we do not hold gold and silver because we're, yeah, yeah you know, I'm going to hold this for one year and then it's going to suddenly be worth 10 times the amount and I'm going to sell it. This is my opinion that gold and silver should be held indefinitely, indefinitely. And so that's the way it works. And as a result, you don't need to care about the price because you know that it's holding value permanently, permanently. You pass it down to the next generation and they're able to hold that in their value. And that's it. The, like some people love 100% gold and silver. And I believe those people are trying to then sell it at a later date to, to get some other asset. I don't know if that's wise. We have to have some level of diversification. So if we just go a little step out from there, something that I argued about in, in my book was if you like jewelry, you like Rolex watches, you could spend $10,000 on a Rolex watch. And that's, you know, not precious metals, but it is something solid tangible that has value that you know you go to rolex um a year from now 10 years from now the price will be higher they, they push their prices up along with with inflation it's the same thing with other jewelry maybe it's a tiffany you know, piece of jewelry they will always increase their price so these kind of things that you can enjoy you can wear that rolex watch but it can maintain value during that period, and actually on a secondary, if you can get, if anybody's listening to this, if you can actually find the Rolex watch today, which is very difficult, on the, from an authorized dealer, from an AD, you can literally go the next day and sell it on the secondary market for two times the cost. Like that's how extreme because of the supply chain problems and everything. So anyway. Demand out of China that's just too. One. Demand because of oh, the amount goodness, of money yeah. printing and inflation out of China, demand for Rolexes, I think I read in the last 12 months has spiked a lot too. Extreme, extreme levels. Um, it slowed down from the peak, uh, but but anyway, that, that's kind of what I'm saying. Like like think outside the box a little bit. You can have artwork, right? Artwork, fine art, 
is going to hold value. Why? It's because if somebody's paying $4 million for Picasso, they, this group of people is not the same group of people that's buying seven shares of Amazon. Okay? These, are, these are very different groups of people. And so those people do not experience recessions. You have to look at the assets that only are usually available to a wealthier class of people. Those ones hold value. That's what precious metals is the, the one that you look at cultures in the East, the wealthier families pass on gold coins or high care jewelry, and they keep the wealth within the family. You see that. And that's just yeah. the way it goes. Yeah. And of course, you have real estate too. Yeah, I was going to bring up real estate, land. Phys- so it's physical, it's physical commodities. So real estate, land, housing, commercial real estate, and then physical gold and silver are some of the main staples for old money wealth. Also, maybe some stocks, but in this environment, um, you know, the stock, the valuations on the stock market were very, very high. And if we had a deflationary bear market, so like the consumer staples companies, the utilities, but in this environment, I think like a lot of these companies are dealing with a lot of costs. What do you think though about like the community now of Bitcoin and pre- uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency people? It seems like a lot of people have quit gold and silver because of the manipulation. And so they, uh, there's a growing amount of people that have sold all their gold, sold all their silver, sold all their mining stocks. And they're going all in. I just see this posted everywhere. Mostly it's young adults all in on Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. I ask them if they're diversified. And then some of them tell me they just own a handful of different cryptos and they're going to the moon eventually. The rally is going to be enormous. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So I need to preface this by saying I, I, when I read the original Satoshi Nakamoto white paper, which if, if whether you like crypto or not, Everybody should read the paper. Okay. And the first line is something to the effect of um, transacting between peer to peer without a financial institution. That alone makes it attractive because I want to give money to you. You want to give money to me. Nobody else has to know about it. And that's what makes it fantastic. And also, if anybody transfers money internationally, I regularly have to send money overseas. When I do so, I'm getting ripped left, right, and left, right, and center on the fees. Okay, there's conversion fees, there's there's transaction fees, and so on. So, I love that concept. What I want to see is, I want to see instead of this is what Bitcoin could be. This is what Ethereum could be, and these are the transactions that happen every day. Well, those transactions aren't really utilized. I'm not going to the store and paying with. Bitcoin. Nobody's going to do that. Nobody's going to pay with Ethereum because the belief is next year it's going to be worth more. Next, the following year it's going to be worth more. So why would I pay something today, like the pizza that was worth whatever ten million dollars or whatever it was? It's we we realize that that's a silly thing if we believe that it's going to be worth more tomorrow. So that's the concern I have is that technology can be great. We can have so much from this and eliminate you know, the control that some of the you know financial institutions have and everything, you can't get sanctioned when you're using Bitcoin and this and that. Um, and people in countries like Iran and other places that are using it because they have to today. So it has fantastic advantages. However, I want to see more getting done with it. I want to see more tangible use case for it and not simply a hope that, this is going to be the next big thing because I want to see more development. That, that's kind of where I stand on it. I think it's a good thing ultimately, uh, but to to put all your money in it is is a, an extreme risk. Yeah, it's a gambler's mentality. And a lot of people that have been buying Bitcoin on the dip and these other altcoins and other cryptos on the dip, they haven't been buying them for the reasons you mentioned about how like they don't trust the government, they don't trust central banks, they don't want fees. A lot of them are just buying it for speculation purposes because they tell me they're going to get rich off of it. Yeah, that's literally the case. If you listen to what they say, they're like, Bitcoin is fantastic. It's the best thing ever. And I'll tell you why. It's because it's going to be worth $100,000. And you know that those people are not true Bitcoin believers. A true Bitcoin believer never talks about the price. They always talk about the fundamentals. 
whether it's the Satoshi Nakamoto white paper or something else that they really love about it, but it's never about the price. So that's the difference. But I'm not saying it can't go to 100,000. It absolutely can. But where is the direction of it? If it's based solely on price, then it's never going to be able to achieve the goals. Yeah, there needs more research and development. I mean, the Lightning Network, I was interviewing experts years ago about the Lightning Network, and that's moving forward. So that's going to process the transactions when it's smaller batches, the fees are going to go down because that was an issue with the miners and the fees. Absolutely. You want that. I mean, you want these technologies to develop in advance, and that's a good thing. I mean, I'm absolutely in favor of anything that makes it better. Um, I just want to see more happening. That's all. So you mentioned earlier in the interview about shipping, freight, container ships. There's also a lot, and I've seen this on the news recently, Chinese factories, and they're they're out of electricity. So I've seen interviews with Chinese factory owners, if they're actually allowed to manufacture because there's a zero COVID policy or there's electricity shortages, they have to rent, they have to buy diesel and a diesel generator and their costs, the electricity costs are up 10x. So China is not going to be the cheap manufacturing hub that it is if they're allowed to manufacture. And some of these main electricity hubs that are making a lot of these uh, consumer discretionary items, like these electronics or other assembly items in tier one cities, I mean, they're not even manufacturing. So we're going to have like shortages and supply chain problems and higher costs for the foreseeable future, even if consumer demand for some items drops. Yes, it's a huge concern because I don't think people realize how dependent not just the United States is, but the whole world is about um, with when it comes to China. Okay, the manufacturing there is way more advanced than it is in other places in the West. We've we've shipped that out. You got to think like the best computer in the world, the Mac, the iPhones. These things are made in China. Okay, so it's not just made in China. You know, from your dollar store. We're talking about some of the best components in the world are all made there. So they're far advanced. Like you, you can't manufacture something in the in Canada, United States, anywhere near the price, like literally anywhere near the price for that type of product. Okay. So, and also logistically, I've tried to look, I'm an Amazon seller. I've tried to look for many products to be sold to, so I can buy it in the United States and sell it in the United States for general products like not something as expensive as a macbook you you can't find it you, you, there is nobody manufacturing it i mean it's just unbelievable it's just it's just impossible to find i i've, I've really tried because i was trying to avoid the supply chain issues so yeah. um almost it, it's a it's scary well, almost everything, David, that stamped made in the USA is not actually fully made in the USA. It's just really assembled in the USA. So with the just-in-time supply chain, like there's parts that are from China, parts that are from Japan, and then maybe they're assembled here in the United States. And then it, it's stamped for marketing purposes made in the USA. Absolutely. Well, don't ever believe that it says made in the USA. It's, I mean, where are those components? Even the components, if like people don't think about that, but it's all... It, I guess if it makes them feel good, then it makes them feel good. What can I say? <laughs> what can I say? Well, do you think that the just-in-time supply chain and globalization, do you think that that's going to be over with all these currency problems and debt problems that a lot of these countries are going to retreat? I don't think anything's going to change in there. No. I, I, what I see right now is, oh, uh, China has been you know this or that, so maybe we'll... Uh, go to Vietnam, or maybe we'll go to India. But you got to understand, you can do that, and, and you see, Apple has started to open up factories elsewhere. It's nothing compared. I mean, the the if you try manufacturing times, shipping times, and just knowledge of the logistics are like a whole different world from let's say India to China. I can confirm that it's it's a whole different world. It's changing. But that's a that's something that happens over a ten year period, right? It's just it's just this is what happened. This is what they they wanted. We wanted China to manufacture everything because it's going to be real cheap. It's going to be real nice to get stuff for a dollar at the dollar store, so that everyone could be happy. And then you run into a problem here. I mean, what if the two countries go to war? I mean, it would be like the apocalypse in the United States. Everything is manufactured overseas. It's very worrisome. Yeah, our supply chains would be a total mess. Costs are already rising in China. 
A lot of these companies, they say they're going to move factories. They haven't really moved that many factories. They might have a backup factory. I, I'm actually hearing, you mentioned some other countries. I'm actually hearing a lot of factories may move to Mexico, but it hasn't really happened yet. They they talk about it and they, you know, it's like it's working for them enough, I guess. And, and they, like, you got to understand, like, China's so much further advanced than these other countries. Maybe not Mexico, I don't know about specifically with that, but when you look at India, China, Vietnam, these are the typical, like China is just so far ahead. You want something, I could speak just from my experience with Amazon, like you want a product, what do you want? What are the specifications you want? How long do you want this made? When do you want it to be shipped? Where? You give them those details, they got it done. It's done, consider it done. You go to these other countries, and they don't even understand like, how does this work? Like you have to explain the process of how it works. It's as if they only have dealt domestically. So basically you so have those, to start from scratch in those other countries. That's right. So now if you're Apple, yes, you can go in and you can bring teams to train them or what have you. But what if you're a mid-sized company? Are you really going to be doing that? Probably it's going to take you right? years. I mean, you, yeah. So, so yeah, exactly. There's a timeline. So you're just going to go to China and you're just going to do the deal. They already have the business ready to go. It's it's a simple matter of fact. So um, I, I, that's the way I see it. But also, uh, there's a reason why they brought us into this direction in the first place. Okay, it, like well, we look at all these different countries in, in this way, and we see the geopolitical events. But it's really all just a movie. It's all just a story that they're showing us. The problem with China is the Chinese Communist Party. So yeah, you can get. Uh, cheap and fairly efficient manufacturing in China. If you find the right factory owner who has experience, the right uh, equipment and labor, but then you have to deal with the Chinese Communist Party. And then if you want to ship your dollars back uh, outside the Chinese banking system, there's all these capital controls. So there's a lot of large companies that can't bring billions of dollars that they may, uh, made in China. They can't even bring it back to the United States. Yeah, for sure. It's a different world. It's a totally different world there. And it's just, um, I, I don't know what's going to happen exactly because you see the two sides kind of battling it out with words. And obviously we have the situation with Taiwan and there's big concern there. Ray Dalio says, if China goes for Taiwan, the U.S. is going to simply kneel. They're not going to do anything. So, but I really did I don't, I don't know. The, it's, uh, no. it's um, yeah. The analogy I would use for the U.S. and China, they have a very unhealthy marriage. I mean, it, they needed a, everyone who looks at it says they need a divorce, but they're not going to get a divorce, or at least not anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's exactly the, that's exactly a good analogy because there's so many concerns, but they're so married together. There's, you, you got a trillion dollars in debt on China's side, and obviously the U.S. and Europe are very aligned in many ways. So. What's China going to do? They can't. They may not have that partner in Europe anymore. Now suddenly they're very isolated with just a handful of countries, Russia and, and others. So you know they they kind of are you know they're playing it cool. I think personally, China is, is making some of the right moves, but we'll see what happens. I'm recording this. We're recording this interview on Thursday, September twenty second, twenty twenty two. The dollar index is at a near all term, a new near term high at one hundred eleven. Based on the Fed with quantitative tightening, the dollar is relatively strong versus other currencies, also with the Fed rate hikes, and a lot of traders are going to cash, like you said earlier. So what type of damage do you think a strong dollar is doing to emerging markets, China, and the global economy right now? It's having a big impact. And like, if the US, rises, the US dollar rises too much, basically everything else is impacted because got the monopoly reserve currency like i look at what's going on with the whole world basically in a tightening scenario uh the u.s at the forefront of that and then you look at japan like the it's, it's so finished it's so ruined and most people don't want to admit it but look who's the only buyer of everything of the etfs of the bonds i mean it's the japanese like the, like the pension fund the, the investment fund and then um you know, you look at the Bank of Japan, between the two of them, they're buying everything. There's nobody left. It's a ghost town. So that's the kind of thing that can happen. And then you also have huge problems 
where, you know, like the Asian crisis in the 90s, where hot money could start flooding in. Whereas if it's coming from the States, maybe strong dollar, then suddenly it starts flooding into these places and creates and exacerbates issues that are already there. I mean, anything is possible. So it really creates an imbalance uh, globally. So when you have a strong dollar at the same time, now people, because they're forced to use dollars, they stop start buying less. So it kind of slows down everything because everything's priced in U.S. dollar. But also the U.S. is affecting the U.S. too because of exports. Uh, hey, I'm not going to go to the U.S. for that soybean. I'm going to go to Brazil because Brazil's currency is weaker. So I'll go to Brazil for this next order. And so these kind of things are happening right now today. And I think it's going to remain strong for the, at least the remainder of the year. If things go the way they are. For the remainder of the year, the U.S. dollar will remain strong against its peers, of course, in, in terms of real goods. And obviously, <laughs> obviously, it's going down the hole. Yeah, all these fiat currencies suck, but the dollar is the strongest one because of the way the global financial system is set up with the world reserve currency. Also, all this dollar denominated debt, when the dollar was weak about 12 months ago, there was enormous amounts more borrowing in dollar denominated debt from foreign governments and foreign corporations. And this cycle, David, has gone on a lot. You brought up earlier in the interview the 2018 rate hiking cycle with the Fed. So when the Fed was doing quantitative tightening, when they're raising interest rates, that was uh, the dollar was rallying. More capital was flowing here in the United States. That was Brent Johnson's dollar milkshake. It was happening prior to 2020. So a dollar rally plus the Fed rate hikes and the other stuff, you had all these problems in the global economy. And then you had all these leveraged traders. So like the uh, risk parity trade, Ray Dalio's risk parity trade, these hedge funds, these portfolio managers at investment banks, as the Fed was raising rates and reducing its balance sheet with quote unquote quantitative tightening, you just had these blow up. So do uh, you see similar things happening with the strong dollar interest rate hikes to what happened in 2019 with the repo madness crisis by the summer and then 2020? Yeah, that's certainly an issue. I just, I'm looking at it right now where the entire world is going in this one direction of quantitative tightening. They're all doing this pretty much. I mean, you have some outliers, but they're kind of all going in this direction. And the banking system, the financial system, cannot ever sustain itself during these times. I mean, we've been living off of funny money because that's the only way it will survive. So I wonder what will break first. I mean, I'm just, I just don't know. Um, but I do know that you cannot create a system that relies on so much debt and easy money take it away and not have something blow up. I mean, this whole idea of a soft landing is, is very similar to the whole idea of transitory inflation. It's a nice story that you tell people that are blindsided or moronic or you know in love with Jerome Powell, whatever the case may be, but it's not a real thing. And anybody, I'm sure you were saying the same thing, I know I was on my channel that you, you will not have transitory inflation and it's going to be from multiple factors. Underlying it all is printing money. It doesn't end well. So right now they're doing this. They're all going in the same direction. And by the way, if you look at the wording that they use, I pay attention very closely to all the central banks. Whenever they make a statement and I read the wording and it's copied word for word from each other. This is a playbook. This is a playbook that they're all following. And I do believe we're heading towards a very intense crisis. And it's coming from multiple angles. It's really difficult to pinpoint exactly. But uh, I do see big concerns within that financial system. It is not... See, see, the way they do things is they look at the stress tests. And they say, look, if we have the same thing happen, it's going to be like 2008. Are, are the banks safe? And then they go through and they do these stress tests. And they say, yes, it is. But is the same exact crisis going to unfold? Of course not. It's a different scenario every time. And so there's no way for the bank to create a stress test that tells them everything's all good. We are experiencing it right now in real time. So that's the way I see it. And we'll, we'll only know in time what happens. And before we start recording, you actually brought up something along those lines. In Canada, and I know you live in Canada, the, there, the belief is, that housing prices don't go down. It was a similar belief to the US 
before our housing bubble popped in 2007, 2008, 2009, the view from what 2002 to 2007 or eight was that housing prices only go up. Ben Bernanke went on TV when he was Fed chairman talking about how housing prices have historically never fell. And you're seeing, you saw a very similar mentality from the Chinese real estate investor for about 15 years that housing prices will only go up. Well, now, whether you're in Canada, Australia, London, or China, you're starting to see the reverse happen. The United States even now with the rate hikes and the mortgage payments, looks like another housing bubble may pop there as well. Yes. So one of the differences between Canada and the United States is quite extreme, actually. I don't know why I haven't heard more people talking about it, but in the United States, you get a mortgage. It's a 30-year mortgage. That mortgage rate that you get, it's 5%, let's say. That 5% is for the entire 30-year term. Okay? But in Canada, it works like this. You pay it off over, let's say, 25 years. of work a different year. Most people don't get 30 years. You get 25 years. 25-year mortgage, but each three to five years, you have to go and essentially renegotiate or, or refinance in that way. So you, you, don't, you, you pay it off over 25 years but you're actually, the rate of interest is going to be redetermined every three to five years. It's kind of, you, you decide. So there's uh, a reset. That's right. And so <laughs> all these people that bought in the last couple of years in this run-up are going to experience a very high rate of you know, interest the next time that that com number comes up for them. If they went to uh, a B lender, which many of them, had to those B lenders being not not your big big five banks or what have you, um, they're going to be getting really punished, and I think may have to be, you know, selling. There might be a little bit of a cascade in some of the areas in the weaker areas, um, and so uh, this is kind of the big concern for for Canada, where actually it's a little different. Also, uh, I think the stats don't quote me on this, but I believe it's over twenty percent of people. Are on variable rate mortgages in Canada. Some places it's way, way higher. Like it just depends on where you live. But imagine that we're 20% variable and every day interest rates are rising. So that is a big concern, right? So that like it, the situation might be different, but ultimately the rising interest rates are the core component of that. So that's why I keep that in my primary focus because that is really the big thing. And they may fluctuate day to day, but ultimately, in general, they're moving up. So I see that. I've looked at the prices. Uh, they've certainly come down after highs. When you look at Canada, um, some areas, you know, I would say roughly 10% off their highs. It's not that significant. Um, but 10% of a enormous number is kind of a big deal. So, uh, but we'll see what happens. We've only really just begun because real estate takes a while to kind of go through. It's not like stocks. So, um, that's what I'd say for U.S. I would I would look very closely again at the at the mortgage rates and watch what happens with delinquencies. If we start to see those delinquencies, um, it's it's going to be like a cascade. Well, also because of rising mortgage payments here in the U.S. and Canada, I think you're seeing record amounts of credit card debt. But it's not for discretionary spending. This is for people to survive paying their everyday bills. That's why credit card debt is spiking here in the United States and Canada. One hundred percent. Yeah, that's a very good point you made um, because. And, and then there has been confirmed surveys and everything to, to verify that as well. So people in Canada, they're not upside down yet because you're saying property values haven't fallen enough. But if interest rates rise, mortgage payments continue to go up when they refinance or have to reset their mortgages, then a lot of people in Canada, they're looking at being similar to China where they're going to be upside down in their mortgages. And can they strategically default like people did here in the United States or is that not an option? No, you can't. You can't just walk away. You can't walk away. So, yeah, like the United States had a, uh, sorry, Canada had a big correction in the early 90s um, and, and literally hasn't had one since. So you imagine all these people that are in the industry, whether they're mortgage brokers or whether real estate agents or anything, or any construction or what have you, they've literally never seen an issue. Just, just like 30 years. They've been in the career 30 years. They haven't seen a problem. 2008, prices only really 
dipped slightly and slowed down and then continued on. Oh, the Chinese so, bought lots of Canadian. Oh, the, the increases for oh, purchases yeah. from Chinese buyers in Vancouver and Toronto exploded after 2008 for years. Uh, absolutely. So they, it, I guess they all left the United States. They said, hey, let's throw our money into the Canada. So, um, and it's really only a few cities, but but uh, now what happened was, and the same in many cities in the U.S., where you've had areas that quite frankly are not desirable, but because they're kind of close to a main city, like maybe you're, um, I just make something up, you're in an A-class, A-tier city, but then you go up to a tertiary city and those places, nobody really wanted to live there. It's kind of not desirable in a sense, but those prices had skyrocketed. The prices had doubled over like a one year or two year period. And the people that are living locally there are suddenly priced out just instantaneously within a year or two. So there, this really created havoc. And those are the ones that are coming down first. So if you want a little bit of insight there, pay very close attention to those tertiary cities, or I'm just gonna, I say it again, non-desirable areas for the most people. Um, those are the ones to watch very carefully, not the big cities. Because you might have it, you might be in a neighborhood where, like, and by the way, investors and, and purchasing for your own self, very different story. Look at the area that has very limited housing. There's very limited, like, condos. Um, you know, this, this, the area is just developed. They've got only so many schools. They've got only so much things that can happen there. Those places will largely deal with issues because there's only there's only so much that could be bought in that area but when you go out into the no no man's land those prices can collapse so that's where i would watch first i want to ask you about commodities so commodities futures contracts for a lot of these commodities are down enormously the last six months i'm just seeing repeatedly demand destruction recession commodities prices are just selling off but when commodities prices were rallying with the inflation data and supply problems there wasn't a lot of new supply that actually came online for a lot of these commodities, whether it was oil and natural gas production. There is some natural gas production here in the United States increasing. There is some LNG shipments from Norway and the United States that is increasing. But overall, a lot of these commodities, the supply did not increase. Do you think that we're going to have a global food and energy crisis for years and other commodity supply side problems in the next couple of years if the futures contracts of these commodities, the paper prices, keep going down? This is like. This is the one thing I, I think about all the time. Did the prices ever deserve to be at those highs? Was lumber in any realm of reality at 1700? Or was this just about taking advantage of the supply chain crisis? And then you have these traders doing exactly what they do with gold and silver, playing around, making a whole bunch of money, and using lumber instead of using gold and silver, instead of using you know one stock, you know GameStop stock and all this stuff. So that's the kind of thing. Like we have to first address why did it go up to those crazy levels? In terms of supply, a lot of these things could be in limited supply. Look, if a farmer is just not going to right now, we've got fertilizer, all these different things, the input costs that are so high. A lot of the farmers are saying, "I'm just not going to plant." I mean, just think about how frightening that is when the farmers are saying, I can't make ends meet, so I'm not going to do it. And so it's very worrisome in that, in that regard. So I don't know in terms of, you know, futures prices and, and what have you, but uh, I would just highlight where do we, why did we get there in the first place and where do we go from here? Um, for one reason or another, I think we could end up in a food shortage. We've already experienced it somewhat, um, but you know, when you raise prices enough and when you increase interest rates enough, you do create demand destruction, and that's the intention by the Federal Reserve and others to slow down the demand and therefore ease the pain. But of course, doing so creates pain. I think we're going to have more volatility, more artificial boom and bust cycles with these commodity prices. The volatility up and down is going to be absolutely insane. So in the short term, we might go substantially lower for these commodities futures prices, but then the supply side problems kick in. Mines go bankrupt. Supply comes offline. 
So I think you're going to start to see that with base metal miners. You're seeing that with silver miners. I mean, if silver right now, we're recording this, silver's at $19.62. If silver prices go another dollar or two lower and the silver miners aren't getting the premiums that, that our listeners have to pay at the bullion store, at, the, at their coin dealers, they're not paying, uh, they're not getting, the miners are not getting the premiums. Uh, the miners are going to be in enormous amounts of trouble. There's not a lot of capital available and it's really difficult to cut costs for a large money company. Absolutely. They're going to say, okay, we're just like, first of all, they're not going to open up any new mines, whether it's gold, silver, or any other commodity. They're just going to say no new development for, for the time being. And so that creates a lag effect where, you know, you're not going to feel that for a while potentially, but that's going to hurt because of how long it takes to open up new mines and get this stuff moving. So that's for every commodity. It's the same thing. It's such a hard business because most people right now, most investors right now, they're not attracted to mining. They're not attracted to commodities in general. They're attracted to, you know, whatever the latest and greatest fad is. And yet they're so critical and so important. Well, well, even if you want to buy physical gold or silver right now, I mean, the premiums are sky high for most items. Yeah, for sure. And like, like I said, when I look at it, I don't even look at the price. It, like if you can get that physical, and you can have a percentage of your portfolio in physical goods. One of them being, um, one of them being obviously the precious metals. I mean, that to me, it's just a no-brainer to have that. I mean, I, I just, I just don't look at the premiums. But I understand what you're saying. It's like um, it creates a problem. It creates a problem for the whole chain. Yeah, I mean, the, some of the premiums for some of the silver items are twenty percent or more. They're very, very high. Yeah, and it, and I, I wonder what's going to happen in the next little while. Where if we go into a scenario where global recession and so on, which probably in that right now, um, what happens? They just start shutting down left, right, and center. Well, you were there in two thousand eight, two thousand nine on eBay. The premiums for some silver bars were ten, eleven, twelve dollars an ounce. They got that high at one point. It's possible to see. Those kind of things again. I mean, who knows? I mean, we've seen Pokemon cards and all this nonsense. Goes, <laughs> so, I mean, real, real stuff is going to be very, very valuable. My last question before I let you go about central bank digital currencies. Do you think that that's where the people in power, so like the Davos crowd, the rich and powerful economic and political elites, the billionaires, the ones with nefarious ideals, and the central banks? Do you think that that's where they want to take us to a to a um? excuse me, to a cashless society with digital currencies, track and tax every transactions, more control over what we spend and what we say and do because they can just screw us over uh, even more with the system. I do believe so. Right now, um, first of all, there's, there's the private cryptocurrencies and people liken Bitcoin and Ethereum and all that to what we're seeing with central bank digital currencies. And these are two very different things. Um, the central bank digital currencies, we could see the biz um, combining with, I think it was four or four, you may know, four or five other central banks, and they developed their own central bank digital currencies. And the biz was kind of like at the center of that, facilitating transactions and what have you. And to me, that was mean, more wait, worrisome. Wait, the abbreviation, that's the Bank of International Settlements that you mean? That's right. That's right. So they're at the center of it. And there was four or five other central banks that they were dealing with in some pilot pilot project. It was it was just just a beta test essentially, and they were working together, saying yes, we're going to do this, and we're going to be at the center. And I forget it was Austria and you know maybe some other countries in in Europe, and they're doing this right now. And that to me is far more worrisome than the country itself having a central bank digital currency because now we're going and we're creating a system that's basically designed to be controlled by a, a supranational organization i mean that that is a problem as far as i'm concerned because you want as much sovereignty as i mean i wouldn't call the federal reserve note sovereign but you want as much of that as possible and you know you just this is this is even worse than the Federal Reserve note, if you can believe it or not. So um, that's kind of the direction that they're going. Central bank digital currencies are 
going to be used as a tool, like just, I don't know if it'll go as far as what China is doing with a social credit score and, you know, the time limit that it has sort of an expiry. I think that's partially because it was a beta test, but it is still worrisome that that could even exist. Um, but, but yeah, it, it's just not good. And that's why people who can exist largely outside of the system and do not have to scrape by on, you know, universal basic income, you can do a lot better. However, the, you know, these people that are, quite frankly, are going to be in trouble and they're going to be on some sort of government assistance, those people are going to be taking that central bank digital currency and they're going to have no choice. They're going to say, would you like UBI? And you say, well, I have to. I've got to pay my bills. I've got kids to feed. And they say, okay, we've got this account for you. It's at the central bank digital currency. You use your phone and you tap and here's a thousand bucks a month. Otherwise, you're going to starve. And so that's the kind of thing that I I see. I, that's what I see happening. But if you're worth, let's say today, $10 million plus, you don't really have to worry about that stuff. Okay, because you have assets, you have real assets, you've got diversification, you've got physical, you've got security, you've got everything. Yeah, for the average person, for the average person to actually that's outside of China to accept something like a central bank digital currency and that much government control, they need to be basically scared into it, similar to what the pandemic tactics were with lockdown and you could die if you go outside, you know, those type of government fear tactics that the economy is going to collapse. You're going to lose your jobs. There's no uh, there's no uh, monthly checks coming in to buy food or pay rent or anything like that. So they need to really it seems that things are almost intentionally with what the governments and central banks are doing coordination to collapse the economy now and get companies to fire with all this inflation. They're talking about deflation, but I mean, like bills are, the inflation data is still going up. So the whole thing is just a mess. And then if things get worse, maybe then that's the excuse. Then they say, oh, well, things are really bad. And, and central bank digital currencies will quote unquote help you, even though it's a lie. Yeah. People, they, the, you know, a lot of the people that even are aware of this and they know about it, they will say, oh, I'm not going to take that central bank digital currency. I'm not going to take the universal basic income. And then they're in a situation where they've lost their job. And then there's a situation where they got to pay the bills and there's a solution provided and they'll, they'll have to take it. And it's just crazy and it's unfortunate, but that's the way it goes. And once they've got you, you know, you're locked in. So, that's why I say to people, get prepared in advance. Okay. We don't need to look at GameStop and all the, you know, try to like, I'm going to put $10 in and tomorrow I'm going to be worth a million dollars. Like these are like really high risk bets are not the way to go. Um, you know, people need to be prepared right now. Well, especially in a bear market, David, because if there's any bad news with a company or a commodity, with quote unquote demand destruction or a company has bad earnings. I mean, in a bear market environment, those shares or that commodity is going to get absolutely punished. You're going to see the shorts just pile on. You're going to see 10, 20, 30% down within a couple of weeks. That's how bad the bear market is getting lately. And always remember that the citadels and the other you know, high frequency trading corporations are going to be able to take advantage of everything, whether that's price rises or price falling. They're always going to win, okay? There's no matter no matter what, they're always going to win. And so, you know, we can't play the same game as they do, even if you think you're playing the same game. You really can't. So you have to be smarter about the situation. That's the way I look at it. Oh, yeah, I totally agree. This is why I don't day trade, because I don't want to trade against these high-frequency trading algorithms and these hedge funds and these portfolio managers at the investment banks that can see how fast the data is moving with the trades. I'm, I'm looking at sentiment. I'm looking at what's cheap, what's hated. So something that six months, 12 months from now, the company can improve. The commodity fundamentals will improve. I'm, I'm looking for margin of safety and also for risk-reward that has upside, but it's also cheap and hated from a valuation standpoint. Companies that can survive maybe a bear market or they're the low cost producer in a commodity. And so if there is a bear market for, I don't know, six, 12, 18 months or something, and it gets worse, the company will survive or they'll go and buy uh, other competitors then and they'll grow. And then when the cycle turns, they'll benefit. 
That's what you, which is the only way. That's the only really real way to do it. And you know, Warren Buffett talks about these things, and it's people should follow it because ultimately they don't. They, they use too much emotion, and there should be. <laughs> there's nothing less emotional than stocks because it's it's you know finance is boring essentially. So we shouldn't bring the emotion into it. And usually, if there's emotion there. There's usually desperation behind it, and that's never a good thing. So we need to. It needs to be a business transaction. Every time you go to buy something, it's a business transaction. Yes, you're taking a risk, but you have to have the numbers to back it up. And there's been some surprising behavior by people like David Einhorn, uh, Stanley Druckenmiller, Warren Buffett. They've been buying more oil and natural gas stocks, also base metal miners lately than they would have in the past. So I think there's opportunities there. But in the short term, I mean, these things can go down substantially. They're a high cost producer, a miner with too much debt and high cost. They could go bankrupt. They could sell out for pennies on the dollar. So it really just depends on how long the bear market and commodities prices last. And then that'll determine how many of these miners survive. But I, I think like there will be... I've been through a lot of commodities, bull markets, and bear markets now for 15 years. This bear market cycle will eventually end. There will be supply problems. Demand's not going to be totally destroyed. And then we're going to be talking about a bull market again, I don't know, 12, 18, 24 months from now again. Yeah, like one of the things I always tell people is they say, just buy and hold, no matter what that is, if it's, if it's mining companies or, or any asset, really. The, the question I have and, and you have to answer is, as an individual, if you're going to buy something, if you buy it today and we enter a bear market and things fall down, how long does it take to get back to where you were factoring in inflation? And if you are investing in, just make up anything, whatever, Amazon, let's say, okay, I'm going to buy it in the middle of 2020. Well, the stock hasn't moved. So you've had all this time all these years now where you you haven't made anything and yet we have inflation on top of that. So this is the type of thing that people are simply saying, I'm just going to buy and hold. Well, you don't know what comes up on the other side. And that's why we have to be more intelligent about this and choose very carefully and very wisely and not simply go with, well, you know, just buy and hold, and that's going to be the solution. Like th those are not solutions. We need to be very critical, and that's why finance. When you talk about investing and so on, it's most people lose. Most people they think it's all oh, it's all great in the bull market, but as soon as we enter a bear market, then the real smart people appear. Yeah, I would totally agree. And those smart companies tend to be contrarian. So they're doing moves that are getting criticized now. They're getting called names. They're getting called stupid. But 6, 12, 18 months later, the moves might look smart. So that's just kind of, it goes with the territory there that some of the best investments, you're criticized very, very heavily at first, but then the cycle turns. So the contrarians, uh, if you go and study financial history and some of the best investors like Sir John Templeton, Warren Buffett when he was younger, they tend to be really good contrarians. Oh yeah, that's the that's they're big gambles, they're big gambles. But uh, they have they have big payoffs, and it's all based on I shouldn't say gambles. It looks like a gamble. They have big payoffs because the move just made so much sense to them. You know, if this condition is met, then this is going to have a big payoff. Whether it's like you know, Michael Burry during the, the big short and what have you. It's just to him, it just made so much sense. And it did, it worked out. And he's buying lots of farmland <laughs> since yeah. he brought him up. And as uh, the other guy from the big short, I think is like heavily short, at least for the last couple of years, he said he was publicly and he was getting called names, Canadian banks. So he was predicting the other guy, one of the other guys from the big short, he was predicting yes. the Canadian housing bubble collapsing and then problems with Canadian banks. They have big problems on their hands. I mean, all, all these companies do, but um, I remember it was um, Einhorn or, or um, I can't remember his name right now, but yeah, I know you're talking about. Um, I think it's Steve the Leesman. Guy Steve Carell. In, Steve Leesman, Leesman, that's the one. Yeah, yeah. I think that's his and real name is, yes. was Steve Le Yeah, Steve Carell from the movie was, was him. Steve but I Carell. think his real name is Steve Leesman or Steve Eisman, something like that. I Eisman, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that guy... 
Um, yeah, I remember exactly what you're talking about. I haven't checked on them recently, but that that is a thing. And, you know, most people, like you look at what people are doing today and it may not make sense, but that's because they've got this knowledge of something and they're waiting for that condition to be met to then have it work out. It, you know, just because it didn't make sense over the last, let's say, year, they're waiting for this certain thing to happen. And when it does, then, oh, oh now I get, oh, yeah, yeah. So these, like, just during the financial crisis, everybody seems like they're so, oh, well, it was obvious, blah, blah, blah. Nobody saw it at the time, even in 2008. In 2008, you had financial companies failing and nobody said it was a problem. Very few, just, a, just literally a handful of people. Yeah, there's lots of articles coming out about Michael Berry and his farmland purchases, and they're all it's all name calling. Most of the articles from the mainstream financial media are all name calling about his farmland purchases. They might regret that one. Well, David, I really enjoyed our discussion today. If my listeners want to take a look at your books and take a look at your videos on your excellent YouTube channel, how do they do so? Yeah, absolutely. You can find me at the Money GPS, the Money GPS um, anywhere. You find me on any platform, I'm there. Whatever that platform is, whether it's TikTok, I don't do dancing, but I'm on TikTok, <laughs> I'm on, you're not, I'm you're on not, YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> you're not copying Kyla? <laughs> no, no. I'm, <laughs> I'm uh, doing my, my financial stuff, and you can find me on any of the platforms, Twitter and all that. My GPS, I'll see you there. And I'll put a link to your YouTube channel in the information and description section. Again, thank you so much for your time and your insights, especially on the Canadian housing market. It's just crazy with all these bubbles right now. But with the central banks threatening at least to do quantitative tightening, the Fed actually hasn't really reduced their balance sheet that much. Actually, a DC insider told me straight up, he said the Fed's balance sheet is totally phony and there's $12 trillion already. <laughs> so he oh, said wow. the number they're saying is total bullshit. <laughs> and he spoke, he spoke well, to someone at a DC Fed at a party. <laughs> oh really that's funny well yeah, i so got my popcorn i got my popcorn and i'm waiting for the show 